pulsating tool for creating a world that accepts sexual diversity. That's a hot, hot lineup for you tonight. I'm going to introduce these guys one by one, and I will give you a little talk myself, and then we're just going to hear you get down. Kicking off, we have, as the captain of the positive team, Tom Bella. <laughs>
it for? His mother wishes he wouldn't swear so much, but I'm betting his performance tonight is bound to disappoint her. Big hand! in America, men in white coats and no pants are working on new technologies allowing users to directly engage with cybernetic sex organs that faithfully mimic the action on screen of whatever porn file they have downloaded onto their computer. It raises the prospect of millions of people simply opting out of the difficult business of human relationships to get it on the sex bots. And who am I to criticise that? Some of those bots are really hot. Given the misery caused by love, squishy physical dynamics there are perhaps we'd be better off for the side of our systems of the 2000. Our panel of experts are here to help us find out one way or the other. I will call on Long Tom to open that proceedings. <laughs> So, um, 
Our arguments, now, ladies and gentlemen, can very simply be proven just by looking around at the world in which we live. Truly, the internet has us all bent over as a society and is effectively the giant, lubricated dildo of experience ramming itself into our prostate of understanding, causing us to ejaculate with tolerance. <laughs> I just wish my grandma could be here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, to see what a success I've become. Fifteen years ago, ladies and gentlemen, you wouldn't even know what a dildo was. I wouldn't know I was seven years old. That'd be quite weird. A seven-year-old with the working knowledge of a dildo is like Julia Gillard holding hands with Tim Matheson. It just doesn't feel right. You know? The internet has provided us with free, easy to access pornography and information about sex we would never have dreamed of getting our sweaty, sticky hands on before the 90s and the information superhighway. Now, we're not saying that it's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, we're just simply saying that it's a fact of life. Sexual diversity, from your bulk standard missionary position to the thrills of anal sex to the sweet majesty of felching. <laughs> Ask your mother. Sexual diversity <laughs> is in the public consciousness. Slowly but surely, as people figure out that what two consenting adults do in the privacy of their own bedroom or dungeon uh, is none of their bloody business, we're all going to move a little bit closer to becoming a happier and more just society. Now that's the position of, of our team, ladies and gentlemen, we the affirmative team, and uh, we know what we're talking about. Just look at us. Have you ever seen a, a more depraved excuses for human existence in your entire life? A homosexual comedian wearing a bow tie? A sex therapist, or rooting doctor, or box smasher MD. <laughs> and a filmmaker who films her own genitalia. It's like the bloody cantina bar from Star Wars on this side of the stage. <laughs> Without the public's exposure to sexuality and the naked form via the internet, Phoebe wouldn't be able to provoke the conversation she does. Bettina wouldn't be able to talk as honestly as she does. And most tragically, ladies and gentlemen, people wouldn't get my references to Felching. <laughs> The reality too scary to contemplate. <laughs> On the other side of the stage tonight, we have the prudish, Mary Whitehouse-esque rantings of the negative team. We claim the internet doesn't make us more tolerant of the nuances of human sexuality. And I realise I haven't spoken yet, but I'm assuming everything I have to say is bullshit. <laughs> oh, that out, and Just look at them. <laughs> Just look at them. Of a lack of sexual experience by a man in a boat. Don't do drugs, kids. Don't do drugs. <laughs> Stay in school. <laughs> the internet has a major effect upon our understanding and our attitudes towards sex. Sex, real forms of sex. Can now be good? Are we all good? In the gay community, 
where I live. <laughs> sexual diversity is everywhere. Sexual desire and sexual habits are a fact of life and often talked about quite candidly. Thanks. Yep. Is that, oh, is that a thing? That's a minute. That's a minute. Okay, thank you. What? What? Okay, great. Don't you heckling me? You're on my team. <laughs> But thanks to the anim anonymity, brutal honesty, and visual aids of the internet, the gap of understanding between sexual minorities and the mainstream are, are being bridged. Generally, for example, my friends have been quite understanding since I came out, but I think I've still got a few misconceptions about what it is to be gay. I think some of my friends think because I'm gay, the naked female body is just disgusting to me. Like if I see a naked picture from Miranda Kerr, I'm just gonna scream, mercy me, it's the mummy bits. <laughs> just cling to my leather chaps for support. <laughs> I provide a lot of support because they are arseless. <laughs> that's a weird answer to have. You've got to remember that although I'm gay, I'm also a 21 year old man. Okay? If I go for a three day period without masturbating, I'm attracted to modems, <laughs> lamps, <laughs> ghost boy, you know, just any old <laughs> Shit, right? <laughs> but thanks to the, uh, the widespread experience of pornography and sexuality, we're all getting a bit. A better sense of the fluid nature of human sexuality, i.e., we are all sluts in our own way. What we're saying, ladies and gentlemen, is that the internet has taken sex on board and run with it, spreading it far and wide and changing its very nature. It's now a daily occurrence to receive an email telling you that your cock isn't big enough. And if you can't be bothered buying penis enlarging technologies, you just upload pictures of your micro penis to lolwieners.com, <laughs> masturbate on your fan mile while downloading the latest podcast on how to stimulate albino circus performance. <laughs> so I've heard. <laughs> In the old days, copies of Playboy were purchased just for the articles. Today, during your lunch break, you can freely look up pictures of Playboy models reading articles and be considered perfectly normal. The ultimate democratizer, the World Wide Web, has transformed our notions of sex and how we approach it. As my team will prove to you, ladies and gentlemen, the internet is a pulsating tool for creating a world that is accepting of sexual diversity. And I say we should set that tool to vibrate and lovingly rub it against the clitoris of the modern age. Thank you very much. Going negative, Alex. Hello, thank you. Now, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and hopefully not boys and girls after the first speech. My name is Alex Dyson, and it is my pleasure to you tonight from the sweet soft buffalo grass of the moral high ground. The view from up here is daunting. Below us vistas of felching and negativity merged with rivers of avatars, jeers and just general incorrectness. Uh, luckily there's plenty of room up here with us and we'd like you to join with us over the, uh, <laughs> over the debate as we discuss this very interesting topic. Now can I start by complimenting the affirmative side on their a celebration of a world that is fast becoming more unified, a world where gracious acceptance of one's sexual persuasions, perversions and permutations is inexorably creeping into our society. There are no arguments from this side of the room that the trend is a necessary one. It's a fantastic one, a change which is essential if we're ever going to become one as a human race. What we take issue, issue with, ladies and gentlemen, is the claim that the one thing called the internet is it all, can it all be credited? with uh, the creation of this, this sexually diverse world which we are all currently living in. And in many cases, it can actually hinder our efforts to create an accepting environment for all. Far from being a, a pulsating tool, it is more a, uh, a, dank, car, uh, a dank cold and echoey chamber, a labyrinth, if you will, <laughs> a, a terrifying and damp tunnel which only the mighty can enter, and one which, without the proper protective equipment, can leave you scarred for life. It is a cavern from which every four weeks a river gushes for... No, we better get out of that, because my point is, ladies and gentlemen, that it has done little, if anything, to create the bright future of acceptance which is happening all around us. So let me kick off proceedings by introducing the men who are going to uh, show you why this is the case. Uh, first of all, our second speech, uh, Professor Alan McKay. He's the author of The Porn Report, as... Uh, described by John Burney, thank you very much. The biggest ever study of porn in Australia. And he'll be introducing you to a few colourful characters who are ensuring the internet gains no traction as a pulsating tool to be used in the forwarding of sexual diver uh, diversification. 
uh, our third speaker, known only as Ghost Boy, is a literary cannibal, a performance beast. Use other words. <laughs> and he'll be showing you how uh, what might seem to be acceptance uh, on the internet has actually distorted, it distorted people's idea of sexuality so that, yeah, what might seem acceptance is actually a, height, a heightened and far, uh, far more degrading sense of surreality. Myself, well, I'm Alex Dyson. I'm 20 years, 22 years old, and I believe in the healing powers of Earl Grey Tea, the vocal abilities of Mr. Josh Groban, and the right for people to rub their pee-pees and hoo-hoos against whatever they damn well please. <laughs> and whilst I haven't had a great deal of experience, in the intimate arena myself. My physical being is the result of two people having sex. And that's why I believe that I'm more than qualified to speak about the matter. Now, in order to properly ascertain what exactly is responsible for the current world of sexual diversity in which we live, we must follow the bread comes back to find out what was the tinderbox for its ignition. If we were to believe the affirmative side, we must say that the internet was a pulsating tool that created this world of sexual diversity. But you think it all started in 1991? When the first public interactions with what become, would become known as the internet occurred, this must mean, ladies and gentlemen, that a huge oversight in 1984 was allowed when Mr Chris Smith became the first openly gay MP in the United Kingdom. And back in 1978, the protests and public upswelling of support that led to Harvey Milk's uh, election as the first openly gay man to the California public office was also a mistake. And all the way back in, 1980, in 1897, I should say, the very first gay rights organisation, the, uh, the very subtly named Scientific Humanitarian Committee, was founded in Berlin with the aim to campaign for social recognition of the homosexual, bisexual and transgender men and women that made up the world at that time. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It was a whole 96 years before the invention of the internet that people were already championing the sexual diversity cause. As were the countless people during the 60s and 70s when the sexual revolution truly kicked its Sundays off. As did the Democratic Party in the USA in 1980 when it added a new addition to its party policy that all groups must be protected from discrimination based on race, colour, religion, national origin, language, age, sex or sexual orientation. The world of sexual diversity took place well before the world of the wide web and therefore as a tool the internet cannot be attributed with its creation no matter how pulsating that tool may be against whatever clitoris may be in the vicinity. Sure, there's no doubt the internet may play some role in the continuation of this work, uh, but it's due to its nature, that being somewhat of a toilet wall, even this notion is a struggle to comprehend. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you've noticed this, uh, but the internet seems to attract idiots. <laughs> it attracts fools. Uh, there's nick and poots, there's um, dingbats, derbrains, it's a certain kind of uh, je ne sais fuckwit. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's this population that creates a problem for anyone trying to argue that the, uh, the internet is a tool for sexual diversity because for every site that gives you free love, for every site that gives you mutual respect, for every site that gives you widespread acceptance, it also throws up certain educational resources such as traditionalvalues.org, a self-proclaimed -proclaimed informational service designed to provide reporters, editors and other opinion leaders with accurate information on the relationship between homosexuality and the molestation of children. Uh, then the, the delightful niggermania.com, the best site for nigger, nigger jokes, ranting and racist humour since 2003. And the unparalleled godhatesfags.com, where the Westboro Baptist Church preach hatred towards fags, dykes and Swedish people, as well as providing a handy counter on the homepage to let you know just how many people whom God has cast into hell since you loaded their sites. Um, it is here that the people of the WCBC have also used the internet's growing adeptness in creating viral hits to push their message through the form of the classic comedy song. Uh, some of the hits range from a cover of Green Day's American Idiots, uh, American Sodomite, uh, a cover of Scarborough Fair, which is Satan's Lair, uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, you come, Santa Claus will take you to hell. And the rather lazily titled, titled You Won't Survive, covering, covering Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive. But perhaps the best example of the style and class of the Westboro Baptist Church, and perhaps the epitome of the internet's failure to create a world of sexual diversity, is the, this haunting rendition of Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire, simply named God Rain Down the Fire. Hit it! Kitchen in the 
Princess, Sodomy and Doctor Me, Rock Hudson, Elton John, Peachy Robinson. Born no day, great, fifty percent divorce rate, Hollywood perversion, abortion, and sex trade. Breaking priesty botchery, Ellen degenerate, don't ask, don't tell, or come the shot to hell. Sex change, never rain, scat, journal. regardless of their sexual orientation. The pulsating tool is our hearts, which allows us to feel empathy for our fellow human, whatever their sexual quirk may contain within themselves. The internet may still be around to somehow allow us to reach a wider audience, but to be honest, it's done more for the cause of planking than it has for acceptance of people's sexuality, and therefore cannot be solely attributed to helping us to, cre to create a world more accepting of sexual diversity. Thank you very much.
you know, this is what's changed in any area of your life. If you have a person with a disability, you can Google your problem and you can find all the information you ever wanted. And it's the most extraordinary situation. It's really helping people understand more about their differences. I've spent the last year or so with 150 men writing for me about their sexuality, about their sexual preferences. And it's just extraordinary, this group of men, the enormous variety of sexual interests they had. I think I had four men end up dressing up in their wives' knickers. One of them would wear his wives' um, uh, size 14 cotton tails under his bowl shorts. Um, so it's a, a most extraordinary thing just to see the variety that's out there. The one man wore his wore nappies for sexual relief. Uh, I mean, quite an extraordinary thing. <laughs> going on here and why they get so threatened by the fact that men are looking at porn. And let's face it, I mean I know there are women who enjoy looking at porn and enjoy the variety of sexual information on the internet, but it's much more likely to appeal to men. And that's because men have a much stronger interest, a much more curiosity about sex I think generally, and much more interest in the visual elements of sex. They like the more explicit material much more than women do. Um, I mean, women enjoy erotica, women enjoy all sorts of different aspects of sexuality, looking, reading about sexuality, for instance, but that whole, that very visual material is much more likely to appeal to men. I'm sure you know the famous um, South American writer, Isabel Allende. She talks about the erotic and that appeals to women and pornography and says, erotica is like using a feather, pornography the whole chicken. And I, I spend a lot of time getting my men to write about the whole chicken. What is it about pornography that feels to them? And why do they really enjoy that very visual material? And it's a lot of it's to do with the fact that men have 20 times the level of testosterone that women do. And that's why um, they're using, many of them are using pornography to keep a lid on their sexual desires in a way that doesn't sort of rock the boat. It enables them to live in their relationships and to cope with those strong drives. Now, I'm sure you're gonna hear that there's a, you know, a lot of people out there talking about the fact that pornography, people say that pornography is turning men off real life sex. Well, unfortunately, the sad truth is a lot of men, a lot of married men, a lot of men in relationships, simply aren't getting any real life sex. I mean, that's one of the big issues that's emerged from my research in recent years. I had 98 couples keeping diaries for me a few years ago, talking about how they negotiate sex in a relationship, how they negotiate their sex supply. And the thing that really came through there is the problem of sex-starved men. Men in long-term relationships grovelling for sexual favours, spending their lives looking for the green light that never comes or having sex doled out to them like meaty bites to a dog, as one man said. Um, and as a perfect example of that, I had a woman who said to me that she announced to her book club that she said to her husband, you can have 50 thrusts, but don't give all my book. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a very real problem out there in terms of mismatched desire, in terms of men in long-term relationships retaining their sex lives while many women lose interest. We had a big survey in Australia a few years ago where 55% of women said they had low desire. And I mean, when I got couples to write about this, I got the most extraordinary stories. One man said to me, he got so sick of initiating sex that he finally said to his wife, okay, that's it. Next time we have sex, you're going to initiate. That was eight years ago and they haven't had sex since. I noticed the other day, Steve Martin was talking about this issue and he said, you know that look women get in their eyes when they want sex? Me neither. <laughs> um, so it's no wonder the internet really appeals to men because the internet is full of women, willing women, women who love sex. This is very different from the reality, the sad reality of many women, many men's lives. And we live in this extraordinary period of history. We've, we've come from a stage only 30, 40 years ago where women were expected to lie back and think of England. They were expected to put up with sex, to 
to provide sex for their husband whether they want it or not. And now we've had this enormous shift where women feel absolutely entitled to sharp shop if they're not interested. I had one man who went for 20 years of marriage with no sex. And sex simply doesn't happen unless women feel like it. There's a really interesting story about Neil Armstrong, who I'm sure you know is the first man to walk on the moon. And which what you may not know is when he got back in the lunar module, he made a funny little comment. He said, good luck, Mr. Gorski. And all the former reporters kept asking him about this, who's this Gorski person? And he wouldn't answer. And then about 20 years later, he finally said um, that he could talk about this and explain that when he was growing up in a little country in the Midwest of America, the Gorskis were his next door neighbors. And he went playing baseball with his mates one day, the ball went over the fence, and he went to pick it up. And he was outside the Gorski bedroom window and he heard Mrs. Gorski yell at Mr. Gorski, sex, you want sex, you'll get sex when the kid next door walks on the moon. <laughs>
group of viewers, that's cinematicism to you, fetishes such as body piercing, candle wax, golden showers, bondage, spanking, or fisting. That's going to be illegal if Senator Conroy has his way. Okay, that's um, slightly disturbing. You might think that you could speak back to someone like that and try and explain that actually spanking is not the same thing as necrophilia, but what happens to Senator Conroy is, and you listen to him doing this in his debate, when anybody tries to challenge him, you'll say, oh, so you think you should have child pornography, do you? I don't know if you've heard of Godwin's Law. Godwin's Law is an internet rule that says the first person to compare their opponent to a Nazi loses. <laughs> so I think that, that when you start saying that anyone supports sexual diversity is a child pornographer, you lose. But he's the minister for broadband. He doesn't give a fuck what I think. <laughs> because he had, on his side, academic research. Here we have the um, very friendly looking Mansi Kanuga and Walter D. Rosenfeld. <laughs> <laughs> now, these very serious academic researchers have published a well cited, respectable academic paper in the Journal of Pediatric Gynecology, it sounds very serious, where they suggest. Unrestrained access to pornography on the internet may have a negative influence on the psychosexual developmental process. Young people are exposed to frequent images of behavior such as sodomy, group sex, sadomasochistic practices, and bestiality. We have the Minister for Communication, we have academic researchers, and we have the Lingus Bank of Greece. They all agree we're going to stop this film. Who else do they have on their side? What about some youth workers? Mary Crabb, I haven't managed to find a picture of her. I don't know what her secret is. <laughs> uh, no, that is the future. That is <laughs> and David Corlett, they are youth workers who have published a very well respected article on the dangers of internet sex, which includes the fact that it can actually promote anal sex. <laughs> turns you on, you're going to hell. <laughs>